Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast of the influence of particle size and associated sedimentary processes on wetland gain and loss in the Mississippi River Delta. I am Matt Reiner of Beckham Coulter, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's webcast is sponsored by Beckman Coulter. Uh, we are a leader in laboratory instrumentation globally. Before we start, there's a few instructions. We want to hear from you during this interactive broadcast, so please ask questions or leave us a comment. <clears throat> Answers welcome, too. You can all do this by hitting the green Q&A button on the lower left of the presentation window and typing in your comments and questions. We'll try to get to as many as we can, and we'll follow up if we don't have time today. If you want a better look at the slides, you can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you can't hear or see this presentation properly, please let us know by clicking on the support button on the top right or use the Q&A button. We'll make sure to resolve any issues. Now let's get ready, <clears throat> now let's get right to today's presentation. We are proud to uh, present Dr. Alexander Kolker from the Louisiana University's Marine Consortium. Dr. Kolker received his uh, BS at UC Santa Cruz, a master's and PhD in uh, marine and atmospheric science at uh, State University of New York, Stony Brook. Then he served on uh, Tulane, a research faculty member, and accepted a permanent position at Louisiana Marine Consortium. He still teaches at Tulane, and he's, he's put together a really exciting talk for us today. So I'm going to turn it right over to Dr. Coker, and I'll return at the end to take your Q&A. Matt, thanks so, thanks so much for that introduction. Uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, to this talk. I hope that you guys uh, find this int uh, interesting. I'll be talking about uh, sort of wet processes regarding wetland loss and wetland gain in coastal Louisiana. It's a, an intellectually fascinating process. And it's also one uh, that is uh, that has a lot of very important applied implications. Uh, if we go to the uh, go to the first slide, uh, what you can see, uh, what I've got here is the uh, the Mississippi River Delta from space, and uh, this is this is the area that I will, will mostly be talking about. Um, the Delta, the Mississippi River Delta, sits at the mouth of North America's largest river. And it was built, roughly speaking, over the uh, over the last five thousand five to seven thousand years, as sediments from the river were deposited in the uh, in the coastal zone. You can see a, a few salient features of the delta that I might the, of the system that I might point out. So, for example, we've got the we've got the Mississippi River right here, which is the main stem of the Mississippi River. You can see the, the city of New Orleans. Uh, the city of New Orleans would be located right here. Uh, you can see the, the mouth of the Mississippi River, which is marked as the Bird's Foot Delta. And you can see the, uh, the Wax Lake and the Atchafalaya River Delta. Uh, one thing that's inter another feature that you can see is between the Mississippi River, between, you can see the, uh, the old lobes of the Mississippi River. As I'll point out in just a second, the river switches course every, uh, roughly speaking, every thousand years. Um, you can see the old river courses of the, of the Mississippi River. So, for example, this right here is Bayou Lafouche, which was, uh, Lafouche is French for the fork. Uh, it was a fork off the Mississippi River, and this was actually the main course of the Mississippi River until about 500, uh, 500 years ago. You can see other bayous, for example, this would be Bayou Tesh, which was about 2,000 years ago, of course, in the Mississippi River. Between that, we've got large interdistributary bays. Uh, let's say, for example, Terrebonne Bay and Barataria Bay right here. Uh, another interesting feature about the system is that the river, for, to, for the most part, no longer flows through its delta. There are a series of levees along the Mississippi River, and that largely prevents overland flow. Uh, the only places where the river actually reaches the ocean are at the mouth of the river by the Bird's Foot Delta, at the mouth of the Wax Lake and the Atchafalaya River Delta, and periodically when a flood control structure called the Bonacary Spillway is open. So 
why why should we care about this system? Why um, it's a it's an interesting it's, it's a beautiful system, but are there are there other reasons why we should care about this system? And the answer is yes. Um, and that's in large part it's economically one of the most important parts of one of the most important coastal areas in the United States. Uh, the ports of New Orleans and South Louisiana account for something like 150 billion dollars a year in commerce. Louisiana uh, Gulf Coast accounts for about a third of the nation's oil infrastructure, uh, about a third of the nation's seafood production. It's, uh, it is beautiful and ecologically important. It's home to um, numerous migratory waterfowl and other, uh, and other ecologically important species, and it's home to over one million people, including some of the nation's most unique cultures. Like I said, the system was formed over the over the last uh, thousand year, over the last five thousand years. Um, and the short story of how this system uh, is built is that when the river is close to an area, it brings in uh, sediments and fresh water, uh, and when and uh, those, that material gets deposited in uh, in the coastal zone, uh, and then eventually the system will aggrade, it will build up, and it will become so high that the, that the channel configuration becomes unstable, and the channel switches uh, switches elsewhere. This is basically how the enti- how the how the landscape was formed, uh, and it, it is you know one of the great sedimentary. Uh, features of, of, of the earth today, uh, of the modern earth. Um, and so you can see each, no, each number here corresponds to a different, uh, a different time lobe of the, of the, um, of the Mississippi Delta formation. It's also, um, it's also a really, really big system. So we've got here just the average discharge of, uh, of the Mississippi River uh, compared to other distributaries and other systems that people might have heard from. So the, on average, the lowermost Mississippi do, delivers something on the order of 17,000 uh, cubic meters per second. Uh, if you compare that to systems that people might be familiar with, like the Potomac and the Hudson, it absolutely dwarfs it. Uh, I've got here a few systems that you might not have heard of, uh, just called, uh, so for example, Baptiste Colette right here. I only put that in there that this is uh, one of the offshoots of the Mississippi River near the bird's foot. Uh, I put that in there because it's a system that most of you have probably not ever heard of, and you can see that it is substantially larger than systems that I would have expected you to hear of, like the Potomac and the Hudson and the Colorado. So a very, very large system. Uh, on average, if you look at it during, uh, during flood, it, it is completely dwarf system. So if you're thinking about things like Particle transport, sediment transport, et cetera. You have to be thinking about the, uh, the flow of water and the volume of water in the system and the capacity for this water to, to, to move sediment. Uh, it is quite substantial. Um, the other thing that I think that is important about this system is that the area has lost a tremendous amount of land. It's lost something on the order of 1900 square miles about 4,500 square kilometers over the past century. Uh, people often talk about that in terms of a football field per hour or a football field per, per, per unit time. Uh, it's, it's really remarkable. It's enough land that if all that land loss was concentrated in the state of Delaware, we'd have 49 states in the U.S. rather than 50. So it, it's really, really quite substantial. And given the importance of the Delta, to the rest of the United States, uh, to the importance of the Delta to the rest of the United States in terms of transportation and commerce and infrastructure, seafood production, and uh, ecological value, this land loss is, is not trivial and it's, and it's not simply academic. It's, it's a major uh, issue of practical importance. Why are we losing land? Uh, I think you, many of you have probably heard of this. There are a lot of of reasons, uh, there's no single cause of land loss, and in fact, some of these things over, uh, interact. But I will show you a little bit more about a few and a little bit of research that we've done um, on this topic. Uh, one issue of land loss is the the high rates is the high rates of subsidence. So Louisiana is sinking. You've probably heard of this. New Orleans, parts of New Orleans are below are below sea level. You've probably heard that. Due to a variety of reasons, uh, largely the, so probably the two big ones, P 
Peat is compacting, so organic soils dewater and compact. Uh, also, a lot of there's been a lot of fluid withdrawal, uh, oil and gas withdrawal, and uh, and groundwater withdrawal. Uh, another reason: uh, global sea level rise. So global sea levels are rising, uh, and the global rate of global sea level rise is accelerating. So that would be another reason. Uh, reduced sediment deposition. Uh, is one, so there's levees along the lower Mississippi River, like I showed you, prevent sediment from entering the Mississippi River. Uh, dams along the upper Mississippi River prevent, uh, prevent some of that sediment from even reaching the coastal zone. There's been a lot of canals constructed in the, there's been a lot of canals constructed in the, in the region for oil and gas activity and navigation. Uh, so that's a, that's a cause of, uh, land loss. There's been a lot of hurricane activity. Uh, and there's been a lot of eutrophication. There's a lot of nutrients that have been added to the system, and that changes the plant community. Uh, one interesting thing that is not a major cause of land loss in the lower Mississippi River is um, is the loss of sediment offshore. For a long time, people may have heard this, uh, that it looked like there was a lot of sediment being lost offshore. And indeed, if you were to look at a slide like this, you might be, might, might be forgiven for, for thinking that. Uh, so, for example, if you look at these areas, you can see major sediment plumes uh, into areas that are uh, 20 meters deep or deeper. So one might, be, might think that a lot of sediment is being lost offshore. Uh, it turns out that that is actually not the case. Uh, it turns out that, that is, uh, there is some sediment lost offshore, but if you do a, a mass balance of the system, only a, uh, less than a third of the material that passes by Baton Rouge is transported to uh, to Southwest Pass, uh, which is which is this one. Um, uh, most of the sediment is either trapped in nearshore channels uh, or uh, in nearshore distributaries or in the cha- in the channels themselves, uh, the channel itself, which is interesting because it means that uh, that material is around for um, for coastal restoration, and I'll talk about that later. We can look at, and this is a paper I was not directly part of this paper, but I think it really sets the stage nicely, and one can look at issues like the total load and also the sand load. Uh, there's a lot of interest in, ter- in this area in terms of what is the, the difference between the, what fraction of the load is sand uh, and fine, um, and I'll get into this more later, but they have different properties, of course. Sand is probably better for building up a marsh, uh, and it has lower compaction rates, so it can build up an area more rapidly. Fines, on the other hand, uh, typically are transported further and can get into into, into wetlands um, and interdistributary uh, sort of backwater systems, excuse me, but isolated systems more easily. So knowing the difference between sand, the sand load and the fine load is uh, is of importance to coastal restoration planning. Uh, now, one thing that I'll point out, this is some nice work that was a little bit of work that was done by, uh, by a student of mine, Lauren Land, and she was actually looking at... Um, at chemistry as a control on particle size on on deposited sediments, and I'll, I'll just go into this briefly. But essentially, she she um, took certain sediments, she disaggregated some, did not aggregate others, incubated some, did not incubate others. And what she found is that the um, if you look at the uh, the way the particle behaves, uh, its effective uh, size is actually different from uh, from the substantially different from the disaggregated size. Uh, and that has important practical implications. If you're thinking about how these sediments might behave in the coastal zone, the disaggregated size that you might measure by, let's say, removing organic and deflocculating sediments is very different from the size that, uh, from the way a particle might behave in nature. So we can actually look at uh, treated versus untreated sediments uh, this is we've got uh, part of, we've got treated versus untreated sediments here. For example, uh, in this top in this top sediment in freshwater sediments, and you can see with treating with treatment and no treatment, uh, the actual particle si- <clears throat> the particle size of the sediments are substantially different. So as we begin to talk about uh, how these systems behave in nature, we have to realize that what you might measure in lab is actually quite different. Uh, from the way the system might behave in nature. Um, I'll talk to you for a second about wetland loss and a little bit of work that I've done on this matter. 
uh, in terms of a driver of wetland loss. So we put this in, in context in uh, terms of Grand Isle, uh, Gal- we looked and we looked effectively at sea level change in Galveston, Grand Isle, and Pensacola. Um, these areas all have long-running tide gauges, uh, so water level gauges uh, that have been running for the last, uh, let's say, 50 to, and 50 to almost 100 years, more like 70 to almost 100 years. Uh, and one thing that you can see is that, grant, is that the rates of sea level rise at these places in terms of millimeters per year are substantially different. Grand Isle, the rate of relative sea level rise is on the order of nine millimeters a year. At Pensacola, it's on the order of two and a half millimeters a year. At Galveston, it's on the order of six millimeters a year. Uh, the other thing you can see is there's a lot of variability. So the variability and the variability in these systems is often an order of magnitude greater than the long-term trend. So if we look at the year-to-year variability just or a, the variability from a few years to each other, let's say at Grand Isle, you can see it's on the order of tens to hundreds of millimeters, where the, whereas the long-term variability is, you know, uh, nine millimeters or so. Another thing that's interesting about this variability is that it's spatially coherent. So places like here, where the variability, where, where the gauges overlap, you can see actually that the, that the, that the variability is coherent between, let's say, uh, two gauges between, for example, the gauge, the Pensacola and the Galveston gauge, or the Pensacola and the Grand Isle gauge. So you can see that there's spatially coherent variability. Uh, if one, one way that we can get at what this variability is, is that we can detrend the variability. We can take the gauge at Grand Isle. Uh, we can take and we can uh, detrend it and look for years when sea level is higher than normal and sea level is lower than normal. And we can go and we can reconstruct, use the NCEP NCAR reanalysis tool and deconstruct uh, sea level during years when sea level is higher than normal and low sea le- years when sea level is lower than normal. The short story is that when, during years when sea level is higher than normal, we've got, uh, a, we've got a low pressure system that's typically over the north, that's typically over the, this, uh, central Gulf of Mexico, which directs winds, uh, onshore. And when sea level is, uh, lower than normal, we see the opposite. We typically see a high pressure anomaly, which directs winds offshore, suggesting that there's a dynamic control on sea level change. That dynamic control is, um, there's a dynamic control in sea level change. The short story is because if we are correct in that, assuming that this interannual variability results from meteorological factors, then we can remove the correlated interannual variability by subtracting uh, one gauge from another. And interestingly, because Pensacola is stable and Grand Isle and Galveston are moving. Pensacola, it turns out, sits on limestone. Galveston and Grand Isle sit on soft sediments, largely, un- largely unconsolidated silts and clays, uh, with some, uh, with so- uh, some sand on the top. We can actually see, um, we can, we, we can see, um, uh, we can subtract one, the one gauge from another and get an inferred subsidence curve. This is what our inferred subsidence curve looks like, and I'll just focus on Galveston, on Grand Isle, but we've got a period of slow sea level rise, followed by a period of relatively uh, rapid uh, subsidence, followed by a period of slow subsidence. We can break that uh, sea level record into, uh, into, we can look at what the rates are for various periods, um, and these are the rates here at Grand Isle on the right. So relatively slow at the start, um, from the period from, let's say, 1947 to 1958, we've got three millimeters a year, a little, little over three. From 1959 to 1999, we've got much higher uh, sea level rise. And then from 1992 to the present, much lower. We can break these apart into slightly into more detailed units and get more detailed rates. If we look at what the rates are, uh, if we, another way to look at this, these rates is to break them apart for, uh, six year periods. 
wife six years. Six years is nice. It removes most of the interannual correlated in your annual variability. And then uh, it also helps correct for an 18.6 year title cycle. We can see inferred subsidence rates that go up, that accelerate at the, uh, from the 1940s to the 1970s and then drop off. Uh, this interestingly is, um, highly correlated with the production, the history of oil production in South Louisiana. And so as oil production rates uh, accelerated, so did subsidence rates. As subsidence, as oil production rates go down, so did subsidence rates. That suggests that fluid withdrawal is a major control on, uh, on, on subsidence. So a very interesting surface to subsurface connection. And as we think about issues like particle size, we have to think about what is the you know, oil, you know, oil geologists think about all of this at the same, uh, regularly, but what are the, um, what are the reservoir characteristics? What are the sedimentary characteristics of the uh, material above? How does of uh, how does pulling out oil and gas change the orientation of the particles and lead to subsidence? So there is a very important particle size com- control on this uh, related to the oil and gas control, um, the, the fluid withdrawal control. That's also, I would say, associated with rec- with problems of land of land loss. So land, we've got here land loss in the Barataria Basin. This is one of those large interdistributary basins in black, uh, and its correlation with subsidence in blue. Uh, what we su- what we suggest here is that as subsidence rates go up, so did land loss. As subsidence rates drop, so did land loss. So uh, fluid withdrawal is the major control on subsidence, and subsidence is the major control on land loss. It's certainly not the only thing. There's also a lot of, as I said earlier, a lot of other issues, canals that have been constructed, levees that have been built. Uh, but we would say subsidence acts as something of a master control um, that lowers the resilience of wetlands and, and thereby aggravates wetland loss. What do we do about this? Is it all, is it all a, a lost cause? We are coming up on the 10th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina, and I think a lot of people are asking, where does Louisiana stand in the, in the area since Hurricane Katrina? Uh, and one of the one of the more interesting things to happen in the state in the last uh, forty in the last decade uh, is the uh, development of very serious coastal restoration plans. Um, uh, and one of these one of the, the plans call for uh, a lot of things. They call for strengthening levees. They call for uh, pumping sediment out of the Mississippi River uh, and directly building wetlands. And they also call for uh, partially diverting the flow of the Mississippi River. What I've got here in black are all of the areas where the Mississippi, where the, the, uh, where the state's master plan calls for uh, effectively cutting strategic holes in the river levees and, and letting it flow something close to its natural course. At the beginning of this talk, um, right at the beginning of this talk, I told you that the whole area, that all of coastal Louisiana was built by the river uh, depositing sediments in the coastal zone. If we return to this, the idea is to do something, uh, to do something similar, to, uh, cut crevasses in the levees in strategic locations and to allow, uh, the river to flow something close to its natural course and build land. There's a big question about whether or not this can be done and how feasible it is and it's, it's a fascinating scientific problem to work on. Um, how much land can we build if you look at strategies of restoration in, um, if you look at other crevasses that have been cut, that were cut in the river over the last century, you can see that these crevasses often, uh, build something on the order of a few hundred square kilometers worth of land over a time scale of, of less than a century. Um, that's kind, that's order of magnitude, the, the, the scale of the system that we're, we're looking at. Um, as a scientist, we can study some of these areas that are analogous to the kind of river diversions that are proposed by by the state and many scientists. Um, and if you can, if you uh, can look, for example, there's a. I'll just point out a few. There's the West Bay diversion at the mouth of the Mississippi River. Uh, there's the Carnarvon and Davis Pond diversion, uh, which are uh, near New Orleans. Those are relatively small. There's artificial features in the bird's foot. So if you look. At, uh, if you look, for example, at this area, 
there's a lot of, and we'll zoom in closer to that in, in just a few minutes. There's a lot of, um, of there's a lot of areas that are in there that with active channels that are analogous to the kind to uh, version like settings. So these diversions have captured a lot of a lot of attention. Why there and there are I would say a, a number of trade offs associated with them. Why should we? Why should people put in build uh, build these and why why might they not? Um, the advantage of them they are capable of transporting large quantities of sediments to receiving basins. So they are an effective way to move uh, to move sediments. They are effectively gravity fed and so. The uh, operational costs are long-term, uh, much less than, let's say, dedicated dredging. And the continued delivery of sediments um, allow for um, long sediment delivery over a long period of time, which has the ability to uh, allow marshes to keep pace with relative sea level rise. So if you are, as sea level rises, uh, for a marsh to, sub to persist in the face of sea level rise, New material must always be deposited on that marsh surface, and you ha if you have an open uh, flow of water and sediment, the marsh will have an easier time keeping pace with sea level rise. On the other hand, um, there are some other issues. Uh, continental scale sediment loads are probably only half of what they used to be, uh, largely due to the construction of dams in the Missouri River Basin. Um, another issue is that some uh, local river environments favor deposition, whereas others favor erosion. So where do you put the diversion? Are the diversion the best spot in the diversion uh, in the river to build the diversion, the best spots on land to build a diversion? And then also they could lead to probably one of the most significant concerns is that they could lead to shoaling in the Mississippi River. So you could um, wind up building land. If you were to divert water, you would slow down the flow of the water in the Mississippi River. And the material, particularly the heavy material, the sands and the like, would settle out in the river and you could get a sandbar forming, and that would be hazardous to navigation. So pluses and minuses. It's, it's an issue um, that has gotten a lot, of, a lot of attention in the scientific community, and, and the role of particle size is, is not a trivial one. These are uh, uh, papers from, uh, from Nature Geoscience, uh, so one of the leading journals in the field, and people are arguing about how much sand is in the Mississippi River Delta, uh, and is there enough sand to supply uh, to supply to the whole system? This material, this kind of paper, was taken up actually by the popular by the local press, and so um, in an academic journal, but certainly with interest beyond academia. Um, my view is that, uh, and I side with the people that are a little bit um, perhaps less optimistic and saying that there's not a huge amount of sand left in the entire system. If you look at sand loads, they, total sediment loads, they've dropped off substantially since the 1960s, and it looks like sand loads have dropped off, um, uh, dropped off as well. So, but, um, uh, as the state moves forward with restoration, and it's a, basically the state's plan is a, a 50 year, $50 billion plan, uh, there are very important questions about sand, in the system, and, and particle size is, is a uh, is a non-trivial question for for many. Um, I'll just show you a little bit more about these kinds of diversion type settings and a little bit of work that uh, that my lab group has done in these areas. So I'll talk to you about West Bay, uh, which is an area over here on the west side of the Mississippi River, and Brant Pass and associated areas on the east side of the Mississippi River, just to give you a little bit of navigation. This is the Mississippi River right here. Uh, this here is uh, is Venice, Louisiana, right here. Venice, this is as far south as you can drive a car. Uh, we often refer to this area right here as head of passes. If people measure how far uh, a city is from the mouth of the Mississippi River, they typically take this point right here as the mouth of the Mississippi. Uh, I'm, I, I'm going to just zoom into an area right around, uh, right around Branch Pass where you can see this. And I'll show you the, uh, the, uh, the capacity for, for land building. So this is a, these are aerial images. This is from 1998. 
2005, just take a look at at this area, these are, this area in here, and also uh, these areas here. So take a look at these areas, and as we move forward over time, you can see the marshes are filling in uh, and expanding. And these, this is effectively the process, the same process that the that the, the plant that river the river diversion plans want to take hold of. So um, it's possible, uh, if properly managed, to build land over over a short time scale. Um, we we did some work looking at one of these crevasses. This was work that was largely done by a master's student, Chris Esposito, that I had the pleasure of working with, um, and I, I sat on his committee. Um, he did some work in the in the branch pass play, um, ran some some uh, ADCP data, so acoustic current Doppler profile um, to look at uh, flux and dis uh, velocities and discharge across the river. Uh, interestingly, he found that if you go from here to here, excuse me, from let me pull up uh, the whiteboard. If you go from here. To here, to here, to I believe the last one was, I believe it was, I think it was this one was the last, to here is the last one. Um, and you look at the velocities, the, uh, the flux drops substantially as you go down this, uh, this channel. So the flux drops from as you go from by almost uh, by almost a, an order of magnitude from 2,000 from 2,700 meters per second to uh, on the order of uh, 260 cubic meters per second, but the velocities the 90% velocities basically don't change. Look at at the start of the system the 90% velocity is something on the order of uh, one meter per second 104 centimeters per second. As you're down at the very bottom you see the 90% velocity at 110 meters per second. So perhaps the system flow is even accelerating, maybe slightly. Um, the threshold for sand transport is something on the order of 20 centimeters per second. Uh, and so the interesting thing, one thing that's interesting about this is that the system is capable of transporting sand uh, six kilometers inland. It has a lot of practical importance, as I'll, as I'll talk to you in, to, as I'll tell you more in just a second. Um, like I said, these, uh, these marshes must, must keep pace. The, how much, so the marshes must keep pace with sea level rise. This graph is just a, a um, just to show you what the, uh, what the rates of sea, relative sea level rise in the area are. They're tremendous. They're on the order of a few centimeters a year. So just to, just to briefly show you that. But if we look at some of the, some of the sedimentary features in, in here. So one thing we've got, I'll just show you here. If we look, First, at, uh, at, this, at this slide, what we've got is the amount of deposition, uh, which Chris just color-coded in uh, red is no deposition, green is uh, two centimeters worth of deposition, and blue is up to three centimeters worth of deposition. Um, we measured sediment deposition by looking at, by using beryllium-7, which is a naturally occurring uh, particle reactive uh, radionuclide. That, uh, that typically sticks to fine grain sediments. Um, and what he, uh, what we found is that, uh, on the outside is that, uh, sediment deposition in many areas that was up to three centimeters worth of deposition with the greatest amount of deposition occurring on the outside of the bar rather than on the inside of the bar. Uh, so, um, that's one, uh, that's one finding. Uh, he was also able to look at the, uh, we were able to look at the, um, the properties of sediments that were deposited. So, for example, we could look at, um, we took a series of X-radiographs. Uh, these X-radiographs, so X-ray, um, is, uh, X-rays are just like, uh, and we can X-ray sediments just like you can X-ray your bones. Uh, if you X-ray the sediments, um, uh, light passes, uh, X-rays pass through the dense sediments but make their way through. Uh, X-rays are stopped by the dense sediments, but they make their way through the less dense sediments. 
So it's a way of getting at the, at the density of the sediment. Um, and we can relate these, uh, gra- these graphs. Uh, so we can look at the density of the sediment, and that's typically controlled by uh, particle size and the amount of organic matter. And we can also look at particle size um, of various sediments, uh, which we did with, uh, with a laser, laser diffraction particle size analyzer. And we can see that the particle size of sediments, and this is going from C4 to C, uh, to C6. So this goes from, uh, here to here to here. And you can see a finding of sediments, uh, as you go, uh, across the bar. Uh, so at the top of the bar at C4, we're looking at, uh, for the most part, uh, fine to medium sands. And as we move, as we move back on the back side of the bar, we're looking at silts and, at silts and clays. Uh, so this tells us something about the, uh, the environment, that uh, what a depositional setting might look like. And Chris was able to put this in the context of a, um, of a conceptual model of land building. And the idea is that uh, as flow increases, uh, so as the river rises with, for example, a spring flood, uh, the, uh, the river is rising rises you get sediment that's deposited uh on the uh on the top of the on the top of the bar the river then um, as the river drops uh you've got the we've got the system exposed and you get sands and muds uh you get vegetation building and you get sands and muds uh deposited and, and preserved uh, so ultimately what you see is alternating patterns in the sedimentary record is alternating patterns of sands and muds um, in this in this bar environment, uh, and we can use this kind of conceptual model to uh, help advance our understanding of how these systems form. And if we want to understand how these systems form, this is critical for 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 restoring them. Um, one point, one small point that I just mentioned alluded to, um, Chris was able to show interestingly that sand was transported quite far in the system, which you know is a, an important practical implication. Uh, because if you're interested in restoring um, marshes you want using a diversion, you want that material to to make it as far as possible. And, and he was showing able to show that sand was transported much further than a, a simple model might um, might might uh, might lead you to suspect. I'll, I'll talk for then a second about West Bay. Um, this is kind of an interesting system. Uh, it's a crevasse that they've cut that uh, was cut in the uh, levee of the Mississippi River right here in about 2002 or 2003 with the hope of creating about 50,000 acres of land over a period of 40 years. Kind of an interesting system. So um, it was conceived of as an uncontrolled river diversion with the hope of creating about 40 square kilometers over a 20-year period. It was opened in the fall of 2003 to an additional depth of about 5.6 meters with an initial flow of about 500 meters per second. Um, now the system is scoured. It is now down to a depth of, uh, we were out there just a few weeks ago, it's now 90 feet deep, so almost uh, almost 30 meters deep. So it's deep and substantial. Um, interestingly, there was, uh, after the diversion was opened, there was a lot of shoaling that, was, uh, that occurred in Pilot Town, so uh, the formation of a lot of sandbars here. Um, this is of great practical importance because this is the first uh, anchorage for ships uh, as they come out of the out of, for the um, as they come out of the ocean. So the form so it's a it's a safe harbor for ships. So the formation of sandbars here is uh, is not trivial. Um, large ships ne- effectively need um, need the anchorage, um, and so inter- so the interaction between restoration and navigation. Is is a concern for many. Um, there was also um, there was a thesis that concluded that looked at sediment deposition in the area in 2007, and it concluded that it would take about 15 years to build land in West Bay. Um, we started studying the system in 2009, um, and we were just about to corroborate Anders's concluding regarding land formation, but uh, events just as we were publishing our paper. Uh, changed our view, and I'll tell you that in just a second. Um, 
This is, we looked at the system in 2009. We looked at sediment deposition rate with beryllium-7. Beryllium is a naturally occurring particle reactive radionuclide with a half-life of about 53 days. Um, the dots are proportional to the amount of sediment that was deposited in the previous 53 days. And you can see the sediment deposition pattern roughly aligned with the pattern, with the, with the, um, with the images of sediment flow in the basin itself. Um, and so the, uh, suggesting that there is a strong river driven transport of sediment in the system. Interestingly, the highest sediment deposition was actually found, uh, over here, um, outside of the, uh, quite far from the, from the mouth of the, of the diversion, which is up here. We can also look at, um, we, we can also look at, uh, excuse me about that. Um, we can also look at, uh, actually I'm just gonna go to, go to this slide for just a second. We can look at the, the particle size of the, uh, of the sediments that were deposited. Uh, so they, we can look at the particle size of what was deposited here. And we, well, we do see our sands being deposited closer to the diversion, so they, these dots are, are proportional to particle size. So we see uh, certainly more uh, coarse grain material closer to the diversion and finer sediments on the eastern, uh, on, the, on the more distal flanks. So that does help us um, provide information that can be, that can be put into, into models. Um, it does look like, like there's some flow down the center of the bay. Um, so we can get a sense of the, of the controls on the sedimentary properties in the system. We can take, uh, x-rays, uh, and, um, uh, of these cores and we can, uh, we can again, we can, we can take longer cores and we can take x-radiographs of these cores and we can look at, um, we, again, we can use this to look at the, uh, the, the kinds of sediments that are deposited. You can see these bands, uh, this is where this one worked out pretty nicely, but you can see if we look at, let's say, core, um, Core 30, any of these cores, you can see uh, patterns of alternating dense and coarse material. So, uh, right, alternating less dense and less dense material. So, uh, probably similar to what Chris Esposito was seeing, alternating patterns of fine and um, fines and coarse sediments. Uh, in some cases, you can see old marshes. So, you can see uh, dark areas like roots uh, here. And here, and you can even see, see, see biogenic material like shells, for example. So we can look at the history of these environments and see that these have been, um, largely river, dom largely river dominated environments for the last, um, for the, for the recent history. We can also, uh, take sediment cores and look at the geotechnical properties of this, of these material. So we can look at, um, the water content, uh, organic con loss on ignition, which is organic content, shear strength and grain size. And we can see that these properties are, for the most part, related. Uh, interestingly, I'll point out, uh, maybe just as, as a little bit of a pointer, we'll look at here, um, which is this area, the relationship between grain size and shear strength. Um, so indicating that particle size is an important control on shear strength. Um, Obviously, if we're interested in restoring a marsh, we want stuff and restoring an ecosystem. For the most part, one wants uh, sediments that are relatively, have a relatively high shear strength, uh, because the area is exposed to, uh, waves, storms, hurricanes, and one wants to build, uh, a marsh out of the, um, or a marsh or an embayment out of the, the most erosion resistant material. And we see that there's a relationship between uh, shear strength, which is effectively resilience to erosion, particle size, and to some extent, uh, also some water and, 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 uh, organic matter. So, um, interesting relationships here, um, and, and the kind of material that one needs to, to, to calibrate models. Um, I'll just show you that slide. So I told you in 2009, 2012, we were just about to publish, um, Work, we, in fact, we did publish work based on a 2009 survey that showed that it would take about 15, 50 years to build land. Uh, it turns out that we were wrong. Um, as we were writing the paper, 
uh, the 2011 flood came along, and that flood deposited a lot of sediment in the in West Bay. Additionally, there were a series of artificial islands that were placed here. So we've got here, we've got the diversion right here. Here we have a series of artificial islands that were placed in West Bay. We suspect that these artificial islands changed the flow uh, in the bay and, and uh, created a more quiescent environment, which allowed sediments to be deposited. You can see that this marsh right here it's, it's, is mostly, it's, it's relatively firm. It's mostly sand, so uh, material that's relatively, uh, relatively hard. Um, once the system beca became vegetated, it became quite resilient to erosion. So these are the kinds of processes um, as we work on, on studying these systems, we want to understand these processes and we want to understand, one wants to understand how you can get rapid land formation because the area is in a race against time. So building, I'll just give you a few final reflections. Building land in the Mississippi River Delta is really a, it's really a balance between supply and demand. It's a balance uh, between the finding a balance between the supply of sediment in the Mississippi River and the coastal zone and the demand for sediment in the wetlands. Uh, supply side issues govern the flux of sediment to diversion structures. Uh, demand side issues govern the impacts of diverting of um, and, and diverting water on navigation. Uh, demand side issues reflect um, the needs in the uh, receiving basin, the subsidence rates, and the impacts of diverted water on ecosystem function, wetland stability, and fishing sustainability. And finally, I will talk a little bit about particle size. Um, to understanding particle size is not trivial. Um, it plays an important role in understanding how these systems are built uh, and is therefore a, an issue of, of great practical, um, practical importance. With that, I will um, just give some acknowledgments to the many institutions that um, that played a role and also to organizations that played an important role in funding this work, uh, colleagues, collaborators, and students, and, and, and mostly I'll thank all of you for, um, for listening to this. So um, with that, I think I can close. Now, do you guys have any, uh, any questions? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Colker. It was an excellent presentation. Um, for those that do have questions, uh, there's a quick reminder. There, there, you can click the green button on the lower left-hand corner of your screen and type in your questions, and uh, I will be able to read them for, for Dr. Kolker. We'll get to as many as we can. Um, I have a few questions for you uh, to get sure. the discussion started, Dr. Kolker. Um, you, know, you, you, you talked quite a bit about a few different techniques, including uh, X-radiographs and, and particle size analysis. Could you, could you give us a, a brief overview of, of some of the other important techniques in your lab um, and, sure. and how they've evolved over time, you know, since you've been okay. in the field for quite some time? Yeah, so, okay, so, we've got, so we use a number of different techniques to look, at, um, to look at, at sedimentary properties. So one, as I mentioned, is, is X-radiography. So we've got an X, uh, an, a portable X-radiograph. Uh, system that's a digital x-ray. Um, it works under the same properties like, like x-raying your bone. You, if you, um, uh, x-rays are, um, penetrate through material based on the density of the material. So different sediments have different densities. Uh, and we can use that to understand, uh, deposited material. Um, another system, another tool that we use, um, we use a lot of naturally occurring radioisotopes. So uh, there are isotopes that there's a small background radiation, background level of, of radiation in the environment, and there's effectively there's micro differences in these uh, in these levels of radioactivity, um, and we use that to understand sedimentary properties. Particularly, we are interested in sediments that in radioisotopes that attach on to sediments, and that is generally fine grained sediment. So we're looking at material uh, radioisotopes like beryllium that has a short half-life of 53 days, lead-210 that has a half-life of 20, day, 20 years, and cesium-137, a bomb product that has a half-life of 30 years. All of these are good for reconstructing the history of the sedimentary environment, and, most, and they all, for the most part, prefer to attach onto 
fine grain sediments. So these material, those methods work great in muddy settings. Maybe not so well in, let's say, like a beach or a barrier island kind of setting. Um, other tools that we use, we use uh, laser diffraction particle size analyzer. So we've got a Beckman Coulter LS thirteen three twenty. We've got one of those. Um, it uh, that that's very good for measuring um, particle sizes of um, of, uh, of samples that have been collected. Um, so and again, uh, roughly speaking, on the order of about you know clay to clay to sand size particles. Um, we do use that for the record. Um, we've also got, um, we'll use, uh, in the field, we've sometimes deployed, uh, LIST, LIT, which are laser in situ scannerometers. Those systems, uh, I didn't show you too much of the data. Chris used one a little bit in his work. Um, but they, uh, it's a field deploy unit, unit which, um, which you can use, which will scatter, uh, scatter light and the scatter, the amount of light scattering is proportional to the particle size. So you, um, so that's another way of looking at particle size. We use other more bulk techniques to look at, like shear veins to look at shear strength, um, buckle furnaces to combust sediments, uh, and we also partner with a lot of other labs that do um, either geochemistry or that look at uh, at, at the hydrodynamics. So the the uh, ADCP's work, work was done by, for example, by, by Chris's advisor, who's a physical oceanographer. Wow. So there's uh, quite an array of uh, tools that, that you bring to bear. It's, it's very interesting from uh, my perspective since, since Beckman Coulter manufactures such tools. Um, we're getting some questions in, and I, I'd like to read them. Uh, first, we have a, a question from I'm, – I'm going to mispronounce the name uh, – Wilhelm Lupenepeti from uh, Royal Haskinen, uh Excuse me if I, I butchered your name. Uh, he, he asks you, Dr. Kolker, on the slide of shear strength related function of grain size, can you a- elaborate on the one that uh, the grain size, there are three curves, red, black, and red? Um, there, oh, great. Very simple, question. That slide. Very simple question. That's so the, the uh, let me just get, make sure I give you this right. Uh, the black, the, uh, the black is the D50, the red is the D10, and the D90. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have another question from uh, Blaze Pizzol. Uh Dr. Coker, do you have any studies that exist that track sediment longshore transport from West Bay diversion to the Plaquemines barrier island chain? Um, Plaquemines. I have not. I have not looked at um, too much of the of what happens offshore uh, at, the, at in the West Bay area. One area that we have looked at that I just for this time did not uh, speak about was um, offshore transport of sediment from uh, out of the Chafalaya River in the 2011 flood. So we did a lot of work looking at the sedimentary plume and where it went uh, and how much sediment was transported uh, during the 2011 flood on the Chafalaya side. And we, we did look at that. That was a fascinating flood. Um, it was one of the largest floods in the last 40 years. Uh, they opened up uh, an additional water control structure and sent an enormous amount of water down the Atchafalaya River, and it pushed. Uh, the the short story about that during that flood was that flood did not that year the 2011 flood was not did not have any more uh, sediment than any previous years, but the sediment transport was uh, highly concentrated into just a few months, uh, and that forced sediment uh, far. Um, far offshore. Um, so basically, if you had a high. Basically, you had a bigger flood. You had higher velocities, and you put more uh, put more material um, offshore into into open water. Um, the interesting thing in terms of a contrast between those two systems, the Chafalaya system, all of that material was deposited in a relatively shallow shelf that was often let just a few meters deep, or at least a lot of it was deposited in a shallow shelf that was just a few meters deep. Uh, on the west, on the Mississippi River side, um, anything that w- would make it out to sea would be deposited in a system that was um, that was substantially deeper. So uh, I have a, a related question for my own uh, interest. You know, did, did, have you noticed any effect uh, in the sedimentary processes as a result of the uh, BP oil spill in 2010? 
That is, that's a great question. Um, so there has been, so, and it's a, it's a, um, it's an interesting question. We were heavily involved in the spill when it happened, and then after that I, I moved on to some of the other um, restoration questions. But you, know, you could see different things in different places. So, for example, um, in some mangroves that were heavily impacted by the spill uh, in the very early stage, we could see a lot of uh, erosion of um, sediment. So you could, the, the roots, it was interesting, the roots stayed behind in one area, but you could see all the sediments had been washed out. Uh, in other areas that were hit by the spill, you could see, you know, you would form tar, tar balls and tar mats. Um, so some marshes, one common feature that you would see is you'd almost get like a little crust on the surface of the marsh, like a crust that would be uh, anywhere from a few millimeters to a few inches thick uh, in places that were heavily impacted. Uh, there's also been talk about accelerated rates of erosion of the marsh um, where the in areas where uh, where the where there was the spill. So so you're still evaluating all that. It sounds like yeah, still evaluating <laughs> that. And yes, and um, yes, and, and there's you know there's there's an ongoing research effort, um, a large ongoing research effort um, to look at some of these issues. We um, yes, so we were. You know, that, that's a short story. So I have another question from the audience from Wes Starr of uh, Open Space Consultants. Uh, he wants to know, do the particles have a discernible upstream history or profile pointing to a source location? Ah, uh, great, uh, great question. Um, I have, the answer is it would probably, it would theoretically, yes, practically, uh, that's more, that's practically, that's more difficult to, to say. Um, often the, the river is so heavily is so heavily mixed, um, and so in many cases it's so well mixed that it's pretty hard to find um, to to uh, to source material. Um, I, I typically stayed away from that, thinking that it would be it would be a, a difficult thing to do. Um, some pe- some people do notice, particularly that you can find intrusions of the Red River. Um, you can see that by color. People do see. Uh, the Red River drains a Permian Basin that's heavily got heavily oxidized uh, clays, and so that material uh, is visually um, visually noticeable. Um, looking for geochemical weathering signals is um, is challenging, uh, in part because of the physical heterogeneity in the environment. Would I would suspect would um, would make that would would make finding a signal more more difficult. Um, and I, I thought about doing that kind of study and stayed away from it um, because I would suspect it's, it would be physically very difficult to get a handle on. Theoretically, if there was something that had a distinct geochemical signature, it might be maintained. Um, but physically, I would think that, that that could get very heavily mixed and you might have a hard time finding it. Okay. Uh, we're, we're getting close to our, our final time, so I have uh, uh, time for about two more questions. Um, so if anybody wants to submit them, please do. Uh, we have one from uh, Blaise Pizold. Uh wh- What are the most common colonizing plants on the newly forming deltas? Have you noticed succession of certain species on these newly formed deltas? Yeah. That is uh, that is my student Alex Amin's PhD thesis. So um, great question. Um, hopefully, uh, hopefully he'll be done in a year, and we'll have a, we'll have a, a more a more complete answer to that. But the, but there is um, there is a lot that's known there is stuff that's known um, that is um, often uh, phragmites it depends on the ecosystem um, but often uh, phragmites is an early colonizing plant um, some of the other colonizing plants often can be things like Sagittaria um, or uh, or Typha uh, the ecological succession one is uh, is an interesting one because there's probably a strong relationship between the ecology and the sedimentology. Um, The elevation of the area determines its flooding frequency, which determines the plant community. The plants play an important role in trapping sediment. Uh, That trapping that trapping that sediment, then um, what plants are there affects the amount the amount of sediment trapping, which affects the amount of sediment deposition, which then affects the vegetation that grows there. So there's a feedback. It's a fascinating question. And um, hopefully um, Alex will be done with his PhD 
in uh, in a year or so, and we'll have a, we'll have a better answer on that. Okay. Uh, so we have a, another question from uh, Shay C. Mingling Hamilton. C. Mailing Hamilton. Excuse me. Uh, you, you mentioned that the sediment delivery has decreased historically by one half. Has the cyclic mm-hmm. release of built up sediments from the dam systems and Mississippi River competence been considered in providing a dedicated source of sediments for wetland restoration? You know, I think it depends on that's a good question. Um, I mean, I, I don't know what, I, I don't think it's ever been. I don't, I'm just talking off my own personal understanding. I don't think it's ever been seriously considered. Um, I don't know. Certainly people have thought about it and said, um, you know, you will see bumper stickers around that say, please send us dirt. So I, I certainly one that people have thought about, um, how you would, how you would manage that would become a practical, have some practical questions and, um, I don't think that those discussions are, have gone all that far. It's certainly something people have thought of, but I don't think it's been um, – the planning has been as um, as serious as some of the, the plannings for um, releases of um, of flood pulses in, in the Colorado. There's been a lot of interesting work on, you know, um, on artificial flood pulses in the Colorado River, and I don't think that the, uh, the level of planning for uh, flood releases has gotten um, – come to that level for the, the Mississippi-Missouri River system. Okay. Uh, well, I, I do. I think we can do one more question, and uh, it, it, it's from Willem again. Uh, you know, what, what, what do you mean by percent loss on ignition? Uh, great. So uh, that's a proxy for organic content. Very simply, you stick the sediment in, uh, in a muffle furnace um, for six hours, and you combust it at 550 degrees C. So, and everything that burns, uh, you assume is organic. So it's a good, it's a, it's a nice, simple way of getting it at, at, at. So if we've got an LOI of, of 20, that means 20% of the dry weight of sample, uh, combusted at 550 C. And we assume that that's pretty much, that at that level, you're, you're built, you're burning off, uh, pretty much all the organics, but not too much else. Um, and we've done some testing to to look at that, but it's it's a it's a proxy for organic content. Thank you very much, Dr. Colker. Uh, for for additional questions, you know, we'll we'll be able to follow up via email. So if you have them, please feel free to email us or or, or type them into the uh, Q and A button now. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Colker as well as uh, uh, Lab Roots for helping us organize this webinar, and of course all of our attendees for for some great questions and interaction. Uh, as a reminder, today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing uh, for six months from today. Uh, you, you'll receive an email from us alerting you when it's available on demand and post on labroots.com. You're welcome to forward this announcement to any colleagues who weren't able to join today. Uh, I want to thank you very much for logging in and participating in today's broadcast, and uh, we hope to see you next time. So have a great day, and and thank you very much for listening to our webinar. And thank you all for listening, and and thanks, Matt, and and, and all your coworkers for, for organizing this. Thank you. Thank you.